All right. So uh, the food bank. Oh, business email compromise. I'm hearing a lot about this. Who's this? Caitlin. Yeah, Caitlin. Oh, it's me. Yes. Yeah. Um, all right. So is this the food bank story? Yep. Yes, it is. So um, uh, apparently criminals uh, have no honor. Um, a group of, of scammers essentially emailed um, a food bank and pretend to be contractors. And the food bank is a big food bank and they're building some new stuff worth like $20 million. And they committed fraud by pretending to be the contracting company and saying, you owe us $1 million. And, you know, the lovely food bank who never would suspect anyone of doing anything evil um, sent, uh, uh, you know, sent them a check for a million dollars and <laughs> they just paid off with it. Yep. Anyway. It's just, That's horrible. And yeah. they didn't even like compromise their email server or anything to make the email look authentic, right? They just sent an email. Well, somehow they they understood enough about the situation that they could uh, pretend to be contractors. Like they knew they were building stuff. So there could have been some level of OSINT or internal um, exploitation that, that gave them the information they needed to pull this off. Yeah. Uh, but there was no actual like ransom or anything. This was just a scam. Yeah, yeah. I remember one of the cases I worked on years ago for the FTC was a fake um, office supply company. Then the scam was they would just sell you toner for really cheap and then never deliver anything. And people would just keep paying for years without noticing. Yeah. <laughs> they made a pile of money that way. <laughs> wow. Anyway. <laughs> so, uh, yep. It doesn't have to be complicated. So I was surprised that this worked. I heard about these things, but apparently it really works. Um, his dad went to a uh, war in Iraq or someplace. And after that, he had horrible PTSD and couldn't sleep and his personality changed and everything. So he made a smartwatch app that will just vibrate when you start having a bad dream. And apparently this really works. And another thing they say that works is to have like a dog that notices when you're tossing and turning and wakes you up. And apparent, and he said he had to calibrate it for a while. He had this, his dad wear this thing all the time for like a few weeks to learn like what the normal vibrations of your arm are and what indicates tossing and turning in your sleep. And after that, he's suddenly a whole lot better. It just like buzzes and and wakes you up when you're having a nightmare. So apparently it really works, at least in this one case. So they're, uh, and I think all you gotta do is install an app. So it sounds pretty great. Something to try. That's really cool. Yeah, I like this. This is avoiding the problem rather than like, you know, trying to <laughs> confront it directly, which is often not the best solution. Anyway. Oh, it's really cool that it's actually FDA approved and they're going to be hooking up uh, mm -hmm. people with it through the... Oh, it got approved. That's good. Yeah, good. And what is paradise <laughs> for hackers? Maybe I should go. I, that's what I thought. This sounds really awesome. Essentially, they uh, made a huge 24-hour um, uh, campus available that's funded by, uh, it's funded by private industry to teach people how to hack because they're like, well, the university system's so screwed up, we got to just go outside of it. Sounds familiar. Um, to actually teach people how to do stuff. So they set up this huge free school uh, for people to learn, go and learn how to hack. Oh, it sounds great. Well, it was pretty awesome. So uh, it's not really criminals, it's just a school. Gee, maybe. Yeah, yeah it's a free school that was funded by a, a private corporation. Are they hiring? <laughs> well, that's what I wondered. I mean, it sounded yeah. pretty to me uh now they did they are partnered up with a um they are partnered up with a school that's based here in california but i believe they're based in san francisco um so maybe we should talk to them about starting up a school here <laughs> maybe we should just partner with them they so you no know formal qualifications you just have to prove that you're smart this sounds right. awesome it really does it really does sound cool so we should totally like uh, get them to give a guest lecture or something. Yeah, yeah. So the what, the school they're um, partnered up with here, I've heard of them before. Actually, I know somebody that went and took like a data structures class with there or something. Uh, the school's called the Holbertson School, and I believe I believe they're in San Francisco. So wow. Well, we should probably start by talking to them. Neat. 
Well, I've, I've heard of 42 before, which is the Parisian one. Um, I know they do like a programming. Um, I know they do like the same sort of deal with learning how to uh, um, become a computer programmer in Paris. So. Holberton School, okay. Holberton's the one in San Francisco. Tunis, they say, wherever that is. Tunis is in Tunisia. Oh, well, then that's not the one. Holberton School of Computer yep. Science and Software. In San Francisco itself. Yep. All right, we should talk to these guys. Oh, they're partnered up with. Interesting. Yep. This looks pretty cool. Okay, I only saved some of these links. This one I should probably follow up on. Holberton School and uh, these guys. I should contact these guys and see, you know, if we can do something together. That's awesome. Okay. Neat. I'm really glad to see people, you know, teaching hacking with, with less administrative nonsense. That sounds like a winner. Me too. And I mean, it sounds, it sounds like it's tailored to our kind of people. I mean, the, the guy they um, interviewed for this was like, uh, oh, I'm, I was really bored to tears and I dropped out of school. So uh, then I, I decided to go learn hacking. <laughs> yeah, these are our people. Right. Right. And Irving shot the living off the land stuff. Yeah, so we talked we talked about living off the land before, mm -hmm. and these two sites are sites where you can see what programs you can do that with for both Windows and Linux. Yeah, yeah. So right. for those who have who have some idea of living off the land of using the tools that already exist, I know before we've talked about using like sys internals, but these are tools that already exist in the operating system that you can use. Oh, you can download with find string? Yeah. Ooh. So click on the download link right there and I'll show you how to do that. Find string, sysvol, oh, you can download from a share. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so sometimes it'll say download, but you don't exactly know what that means. But not from a uh, HTTP website. No. Well, okay, still that's pretty cool. I wonder what else, expand, what is expand? Copy source file to destination. Mm -hmm. Man, there, there's definitely stuff here I did not know. Yeah, yeah the, uh, the, the GTF opens have a lot of stuff that, that's even more interesting than the Windows stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, so there's a lot of things like, oh, oh so like with, um, uh, with more, you can get a shell with more, uh, which is useful a lot in, in CTFs and stuff. Terms. Oh, you add it to a, uh, oh. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, yeah, neat. Yeah, yeah there's a lot, lot, lot of, yeah, a lot of cool tricks you can do with, with built-in utilities and programs that are on almost any system. Yep. It would be good to write like some GTF problems where you have to like get things done in limited environments. Neat. Okay. That's good stuff. And I think I saw this one, Google Play, right? Yeah, Google Play has a flaw in their library. So every program that's compiled to run on the App Store has access to this library called the Google Play Library. And uh, there's a vulnerability in the library that makes it so that any program essentially has elevated privileges to do things like, you know, read from the camera, read arbitrary files from the smartphone, et cetera. And so the, the permissions don't actually mean anything? Nope. Uh, because, like I said, you, there's basically a RC bug in the Google Play um, mm. uh, API or library. Oh, it's been fixed, supposedly. It was fixed a few months ago, but a lot of uh, developers haven't updated their code. So you have to be recompiled with the new library version to get the fix? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, then it'll be essentially forever. I've got a ton of apps I use in my class that haven't been updated since 12. 2015. Aha. Uh -huh. You mutated into a strange being for a minute there. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, well, okay. So many problems in Google Play. Anyway, I was surprised to hear about this. Years ago, I heard about this. These guys in Cuba had weird ring in their ears and weird brain damage, and they couldn't figure out what it is. And now they have uh, deduced without direct evidence that this is microwave weapons, which apparently the Soviets have been working on for years. And the U.S. military considered it for crowd control, 
microwaving people to make them uncomfortable, make them leave, but they found it was real hard to control and had like weird effects and wasn't always effective. But anyway, um, they've been showing brain damage and strange cavities in the brains of people affected and stuff. And it's happened to several U.S. embassies in different nations. So yeah. their, their belief is that it's the Russians testing some kind of espionage attack on people, but they haven't actually caught them with a smoking gun yet. But uh, this is the espionage game, right? I remember reading about this, but how did they figure out that it was microwave weapons without evidence? They figured that it was the only reasonable explanation from theoretical basis. They didn't find any proof, so they still don't really know. But I mean, for a while they tried to say it's nothing, and I think they did real medical tests on the people from China and Cuba and said, no, these guys are really being harmed by something. And they thought it was acoustic weapons. They really don't know yet. Wow. But uh, they say it's happened in China, Cuba, and Russia. So it's one of the dirty tricks they're playing. Um, I'm surprised we don't hear about more poisonings because that's Russia's big thing is poisoning. But yeah. anyway, hmm. well, I was surprised that Trump didn't poison Biden or get Putin to. I mean, it's it's not popular in America for some reason. It's just not traditional here. Anyway, what we mostly do is shoot people over here. Anyway, but never for any actual. You, know, you don't like shoot your candidate to win an election over here. You just shoot people because you're crazy over here. It doesn't seem to violence doesn't seem to be an accepted way to win political power over here for some reason. Anyway. Not yet. Except during the Civil War. Yeah. But even that wasn't really, well, they kind of, kind of what they did to Lincoln. That was to give power to the South again. Anyway, anyway. So the U.S. gathering logs. Yeah. So they, you know, they're, they're, our intelligence agencies aren't supposed to be using Section 215 of the Patriot Law, which is the the part of the law that says they can um, obtain, it's, obtain, it's the uh, warrantless wiretapping when it relates to um, terrorism. And Wasn't you know, that the whole is, idea? I thought it was okay to what's do that? I thought that was the whole idea. It was okay to use it for terrorism. Uh, just for terrorism, but I mean, there are, again, this is sort of like the CFAA where it's, overly broad and uh they're really not supposed to be using it for internet communications and in fact there was i think back in may they uh this was before congress and uh they were specifically discussing um a provision that was saying like hey you can't use this to um track people's browser activity or see their search terms but then um like so many useful things it just died in legislation and um so uh they went ahead and started um they said oh well, we didn't look at people's search terms we just tracked everyone's uh activity visiting certain websites yeah and uh so uh they they you know that's that's sort of that's sort of a slippery slope because i mean okay so maybe you're not tracking people search terms, but it's easy enough to set up a sort of a honeypot of sorts that draws people to various clickbait websites using those terms. So it's kind of disingenuous. Yeah, well, I think this has been an issue right from the start. I remember the, um, the NSA director that went to DEF CON was famous because he had the secret Patriot Act interpretation, which means you can just do anything. And it's <laughs> kind of vague. So there was the public interpretation that says you can only do this, and in, pra in practice, we just do anything we want. And it's whether that's legal or not, it's not entirely clear. That's why I think Ron Wyden's on the right track, that we actually need to improve the law to, yes. uh, to make yeah. it clear what's allowed. Because it was all in response to 9-11. They freaked out and passed a law saying, you can just do anything you need to do to stop terrorism. And we're still basically under those rules. Correct. Yeah. Correct. That's the problem. Because they're just kind of using it for whatever now, as as they would. And this is, you know, to me, this is sort of a cautionary tale about all of the other uh, surveillance measures that we're trying to pass and, and having a, a lack of uh, strong encryption and everything else. Like, yeah, it's, sure, it sounds great on paper when these laws are getting passed, but down the road, um, if you're not very specific in those laws, they're able to be used in ways that were not originally intended. 
Yeah, yeah. So it's it's good if they can actually clean them up, but I think there's no chance of Congress passing anything in the foreseeable future. Anyway, so uh, COVID nineteen scams. Okay. Yep, because uh, you know bad guys have no decency. So there are a bunch of scams starting to show up over the vaccine, and Interpol is warning globally to uh, for law enforcement to band together and stop these at least shut them down as they pop up. So what do they do? They tell you they're yeah. selling you a scam and they need money or what is it? Yeah, they're saying, hey, we have the vaccine. Oh, and they, cures. oh they think you're going to buy it. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, you know, I wonder if you could get the Chinese or Russian one. I think none of them are extra sale anyway, right? Not yet. No, yeah. but that's part of the problem is there's all they're putting up all these spe- Uh-oh, I think we lost, oh, I lost her. But yeah, we're, uh, bad guys are putting up all these uh, markets online saying, hey, you can you can get the vaccine early if you pay X amount. Yeah, you know, I, that's not a bad idea if, you, if it's the real vaccine. <laughs> if it's the real vaccine, but most likely not. Yeah, well, I, I don't think it could be at this point. I remember there was the one you could make your own. There was the hack your own vaccine a month or two ago. I don't know how that turned out. Probably garbage. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> so what's this DNA synthesis method? Right. So um, we have a new method for generating mm-hmm. random numbers on computers. Uh, for a while, of course, uh, there was uh, using quantum mechanics. And then there was measuring you know, resistance you know, in a you set up a resistor and you, you do more quantum mechanics. Yeah. Um, this uses DNA synthesis. And the way it works is that you can essentially create you can tell, you can get DNA to replicate in such a way that the base pairs are always mutated. And that gives you random numbers that you can input into a computer for cryptography algorithms. But that Hmm. sounds like a really expensive way to make a random number. I mean, you could just roll dice too. No, you cannot. That is not true randomness. It's not? Why is that not true? (laughs) Because it's not, because it's, it's predictable. I mean, if you knew if you knew exactly how you threw the dice, you would uh, be able to tell how, where it's going to land. And of course, the dice aren't perfectly weighted as well, so well, there is going to be a slight bias. There's probably nothing perfect about this molecular process either. Supposedly, it's it's good enough to get uh, good random numbers. So, it's just another way of doing it. I mean, trying to get random numbers out of computer is just it's hard. <laughs> Well, now generating huge quantities of randomness that can be stored in an extremely small space, that might be useful for something like a one-time pad, I guess. Yeah. Well, okay, anyway. It's just a, yeah, a new method It relates to cryptography. It's good, good yeah. to know. There may be some application eventually. All right, fair enough. It's, it's, and uh, maybe, maybe we can start storing uh, cryptography in our DNA. There's already been talk about that in science fiction stories about how they examine the DNA and find like a brand name mark from our maker and stuff. Yeah. Um, and already making synthetic microorganisms. So yeah, I think that's totally coming. It's a perfectly good place to store data. That's what it's for anyway. Mm-hmm. Ah, Liz is back. I think maybe not. Okay, good. Okay. She seems to be alive. Yeah. Anyway, so I, I've been waiting for this. I've been wanting to ride driverless cars forever. And apparently they're now here from Waymo. And this guy talks about how it's really safe because I got sort of worried when the Teslas kept ramming into stationary objects at 60 miles an hour or 70. And they keep saying, oh, that's fine. That's expected. And I'm like, how is that fine? <laughs> Why do you think that's all right? They say, oh, the manual tells you over 50, you can't trust the driving. It'll plow right into things. I said, how can you even sell a car like that? But anyway, this thing apparently is fine. And all it is, is it's super cautious. They say it has, it's really worried about running over pedestrians. So if you have it in a parking lot, it will sit there for like minutes waiting for all the pedestrians to really get out of the way, which is not bad at all, really. <laughs> they say it's very safe and harmless and there have been a few accidents with it, but uh, apparently not very many. And so anyway, yeah. I think I this mean, would but, be awesome. Yeah. But I mean, drivers are already fairly safe. How does this compare to, to real human drivers? Well, they say that's hard to compare, which is the part I didn't really understand. It seems to me like it's pretty easy to get statistics of how many human drivers have wrecks, but they they said somehow they can't find comparable statistics, which I don't get. 
but the thing uh, that me out about the Waymo car that I sat in, and I don't know if these are all the same, but the thing that freaked me out about the Waymo car that I sat in was there were no controls. Like, right. So you couldn't like step on the brake or grab the steering wheel if something went haywire and that was a little disconcerting so i don't know if these actually have the standard equipment still installed or not yeah i don't know but there's no driver anyway so there it is six million miles of driving they get 18 crashes but apparently they're having trouble saying how many humans have in that many but you know i've certainly seen a lot of uh messed up uber drivers i think yeah. this is a step up from uber <laughs> Anyway, um, data breaches can cost money. Now, what? I'm not quite getting the point here. <laughs> well, the point is, is that there's actually a consequence. There, we're actually starting to see some consequences uh, connected to um, failing to secure your systems, which is awesome. Um, you know, uh, what's that? From 2014. Well, that was when um, that was when it happened, but the consequences are only um, coming about now, six mm -hmm. years later. So, uh, but hey, better late than never because they're having to pay a boatload of money over this, and I think that I think that that's actually a good thing because now their website's still horrendous. Don't get me wrong, but um, I think it's actually a good thing because part of the problem historically has been that there are no incentives for these companies to secure uh, any of their consumer data. Uh, doesn't matter to them. I've worked at places like this where they know that people's credit card data is being hemorrhaged out into the ether and that bad people are getting a hold of their uh, customers PII and everything else and they don't care because security is just a cost center to them and there are no consequences for failing to secure um, to secure this stuff so I think it's actually a good thing to see some real real live consequences coming about from this because uh, once it starts becoming uh, more expensive to um pay the damages than it is to actually pay people to secure the systems that's when these companies are going to get serious about security well i like this list of stuff they have to do yeah me too i thought it was really I, I, all of that all of that's what they should have been doing in the first place but uh since they didn't i think it's a i think it's a pretty solid list of uh measures that they got to agree to implement yeah, yeah. I mean, that's why I think that one of the legal issues here is that if what is good enough security is not really defined. And yep. if it were, then you'd probably see a lot more compliance anyway. Yeah, but this really spells it out, and I think that's good. Yeah, yeah, that's good, yeah. And it sets a precedent because, you know, like I say, once these, these big money uh, settlements and fines start coming about then, um, and they have, a, they have a list of what you have to do to avoid getting in, in that situation, then a lot, there's gonna be a lot more corporate compliance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then Urban's live stream, I remember I saw some of this. Yes, so we had our first of three live streams uh, for our regional competition. Uh, I do two a year, and this is our winter one. Uh, totally ran by students, four students. Uh, I have the results from, or we posted the results here of the, the, the current standings for the blue team relay contest and the reverse engineering contest. And so uh, you, this, and you get to see them doing the hacking. Yes, yeah, you get to see them doing some of the hacking. Uh, this week, I'll be posting the videos that the team submitted, so anybody can see the because uh, we only talked about it for a, a couple minutes, but yeah. anybody will be able to see what the teams did uh, on YouTube this week. Yeah, and they get color commentary from them, which is what I always wanted. They explain what they're doing and what it means. Yeah, and the the host team is getting better every week, so they'll uh, we'll we'll get into a uh, we'll get into the zone and get this right. Yeah, I saw the same thing. I've seen with my students the first one. Even from the first one to the second one, they get much smoother. They get much better. Yeah. That's why I always make my students do presentations because even just doing two or three of them makes you a lot better. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. 
that's why I think this is awesome. And like I say, you need a good introduction and stuff, and then you can start like getting people to put Pepsi commercials on it and throwing money at you and stuff. Yeah. Because a ton of people would like to watch hacking if you would only make it accessible. That's essentially what the hacking TV shows are. Mm -hmm. All right. Any more comments? No. Doesn't look like it. All right. I'll stop this one.